Welcome to Little Hoppers Baptist Church. Uh, before we get started in worship today, a couple things to go over. Um, if you have your soccer chart with you. Um, so November 7th, we have a retired flag ceremony that's going on at the men's breakfast in which everyone is invited to. Uh, if you have any, want to need more information on that, please see Al Farewell. And then on the 8th, that Sunday, during the morning worship, where there will be a uh, time in recognition of the veterans for Veterans Day. Um, please also remember that Operation Christmas Child is in full swing right now. Um, if you need a box, we have some up here up front. And for any other information um, on how you can participate, please uh, take a look inside your soccer's heart. This evening is the Fall Festival, um, from 5 to 7. And also just remember that you know, we're having the Fall Festival tonight, but there will be no Sunday evening discipleship classes. Uh, also, please remember as we are heading into this week, we are heading into the time of election. Uh, so please be working in prayer for our country and uh, for God's hand to move within our nation. Um, on the perforated flap there, you will see that the Wednesday night meal is hamburger. If you plan on being here, if you could, just please uh, put on there how many is going to be here and put it in the offering plate as you leave today. Also, if you're visiting with us today, on the opposite side of that, if you, uh, if you could please fill that out so we can have a record of your attendance and also just so we can get to know you a little bit better. For any more information or anything that I may have missed, we can refer to your doctor's heart. Yeah, I'm really looking a little bit better this morning. You did that, right? Since I've got that extra hour of beauty sleep. Some of us, it didn't help with so. If you would, let's stand up and sing. I serve a risen Savior, he lives. He lives.
But if we put our foundation on Jesus Christ, we don't have to worry about the fall, right? Jesus is our first name. of our nation. Lord, we're so desirous to see an end to all of the abortion, to see the end of all the pornography and the human trafficking and the abuse of children and Lord, for all of the drug and alcohol issues and yet these things come from the wickedness of our own hearts and the things in our lives when we look for an easy way out. Lord, we're grateful that as your children, you have given us the opportunity to confess our sins and you faithful to just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we pray that you would grant spiritual awakening in the land, that we would see millions upon millions come to know you. And Lord, that this land could be changed, could be turned, could be more faithful to you and your kingdom's purpose in these last days. Now, Lord, we know many people in our congregation are dealing with medical concerns, uh, cancer issues, questions that are unanswered about health. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would intervene as great physician in each situation to bring out the very best outcome. Lord, we would thank you for 
the desk. For every question that's here today that goes unanswered, may you bring the answer. For every bit of loneliness, for every bit of sadness, that you, Lord God, would intervene in each situation and bring people together, your children, to minister and to serve and to work in your name. In the spiritual giftedness that you have given us each, Lord, we would thank you for these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody know that song that this baby was playing underneath? You have to be a child probably the seventies. Share his love. Oh, okay. Childhood, okay. Maybe sixties and seventies. But that's what that's what we need to be doing. Uh, and I don't know about you, but there's only one way I can do that. I can't do that on my own. I've got to have somebody within me. Because that's not our nature. Our nature is, well, you don't like the things that I do. I'm just not going to like you. Okay? But because Christ, once you ask Christ to become your Savior, He resides in you, allows you to share that love with those around you. No longer I. Here we go.
title of the course, if you're not a believer, I can maybe kind of understand, well, you're being awful boastful that Christ lives in you. Yes. What is the one thing that we can't boast about? The Lord, right? Amen. Not boast ourselves, but boast of you. And there's that place when you become a believer that's empty. And I'm going to say that Christ moves in. And if you allow him to, he'll move all the other stuff out. And he'll take it to the rightful place. Who can satisfy myself? Only the Lord. Let us stand as is a duty.
But we know who is in control. It's not anybody in Washington, but it's you who sit on your throne today. Father, thank you for that assurance and that promise and that, that victory that we can have because of your name. In the name of Jesus, there's going to come time that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess you as Lord Father. I pray that we will do that today when we have the opportunity. Father, thank you so much for being on this time. Father, as we open your word, but if you just speak to us in this one, ask all these things you believe. Amen. Imitating God. Now, there are a lot of things that people want to be like these days. And as I myself over time have seen uh, the tendencies in in humanity to pick another person to imitate another person to be like uh, people always fail I mean you know what does the phrase mean they're only human it, it, it points to the fact that we're all going to fail so when we start thinking about as children of God how we would live and imitate God, the first thing we have to know is to imitate God is not something uh, that we're going to be able to do in our own power. Just like Mark shared about being able to share the gospel. You need some power within you to be able to help you share that truth and to have confidence in God and, and to know that even if you're, you know, you're afraid you're going to do it wrong, that that God intervenes on your behalf. And so we imitate God as those who have the Spirit of God living within us, as children of God. Now I'm not referring, referring to the, to the uh, cultural idea that everybody is a child of God. Scripture uh, supports one idea alone, and that is, is that some of us have been adopted into God's family through faith in Jesus alone. And as we start with this frame of reference, if you would turn to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 where we started our scripture earlier today. The things that we see here in Ephesians 5 leading up to this phrase, therefore, the imitators of God, are all the things that were doctrinally true, the things that were theologically true about God and His people. And so having built this whole concept up in the first four chapters, Paul then, led of the Holy Spirit, makes application. Because of all the things that God has done and because of all the things we are as the people of God, therefore be imitators of God. You can do this, not in your flesh, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Then the second thing you want to grab onto is that you are beloved to Him. You're beloved. And so to think about the things that the devil tells you, and I'm, I'm going to just assume that some of the things that I hear from principalities and powers, you do as well. It's a common thing. I counsel people about it all the time. God is mad at you. Uh, God doesn't want you. God has not saved you. God, and, and all the insecurities and the things that people struggle with and Folks, whenever we have put our faith and trust in Christ alone, we have been born again. The Spirit of God lives within us. Now we are capable of walking with Him in this life that is impossible to do in the flesh. So knowing that God is going to do that, what, does the, what are the chances that God is going to finish what He starts? 100%, huh? Or, or as we say in Southeast Texas, that's 120%. You know, you can't do that, but that's okay. I get the point. And so God's going to finish what He started. So part of that is going to be evidence. You remember the passages from the last few weeks where we talked about how do people know that we're Christ's disciples? 
because of your giving. No. Because of how many Bibles you own. No. Because of your love for one another. Ah, there it is. Walk in love. Just as Christ also loved you. And continues to love you. And continues to work in your life. How do you know that? With all the things that can go wrong. With medical problems you can have. With financial issues. issues with job losses. With all of these struggles in life. It would be easy for us to think sometimes about the fact that. That maybe, you know, what's wrong, what's going on, maybe God doesn't love me. Oh no, he proved that. One Friday. When he died on the cross. For you and for me. Amen. He gave himself up for us. As an offering. And a sacrifice to God. A fragrant aroma. Now a lot of people, <laughs> that last part is like, Huh? A fragrant aroma. Now you have to spend a little time in the Old Testament, especially in the Pentateuch, to see how those sacrifices were being done. And the the as Moses wrote these things down, it representative of several different periods of history in which he did not live. There are all of these sacrifices that are being made, and they're all being described as a fragrant aroma to God. And Jesus was that for us. So, now, what is the, the practical application of the fact that we're imitators of God and that we're loved? And we're loved, remember, because Jesus sacrificed Himself. So we've got that, those two things down. What's our third thing? You're going to preach it, we're not used to you having three points. It's like, okay. <laughs> so it's like I tell you, this sermon today has 25 points. Don't worry, the one tonight will be pointless. <laughs> no. The third point is this. Our lives are changed. Our lives are changed. Notice if you would in verse 3. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Now you notice it says real big underneath, I shifted translations on you today. You have your CV, your, you know, whatever translation you have in front of you. I wanted you to see as a companion translation, a new living translation. It's not a paraphrase like the old living Bible. It is a translation, but it is like 7th grade English vocabulary, very clear. Uh, and I wanted you to see those words, because in the New American Standard, uh, which I you know, use uh, commonly, uh, the words would not be exactly the same. But is it clear to see obscene stories? Foolish talk? Coarse jokes? And so I used the New Living Translation today so that we could see in the most current English what the Spirit of God gave Paul to say to that church was a practical application. Now, this is not the part of it that is going to, um, that phrase I just talked about, be what he talks about next. And we're not going to move forward just yet. He's going to talk about the sexual immorality and the impurity a great deal. I think that at this point, we're going to let that move on to the next part, but we'll go on to say, what about, no, yeah, what about our thankfulness? What about our thankfulness? If, if we have been changed, then the sexual immorality, the, the, the impurity of our hearts and our minds, the hearts are deceitfully wicked, who can know it? The flesh is always going to stray toward, uh, you know, impurity. And the Spirit of God is how, and the Word of God is how God helps us grow beyond that, right? But how about the thankfulness? How about the thankfulness? And so when Liz and I pray at night, that, I, I try to make sure that the most significant part of our prayer time, uh, from my perspective, is the things that we're thankful for in that day. 
try that. Uh, one of the things that I also pray is to ask God to take uh, control of the thoughts of our minds and the, the meditations of our heart while we sleep. So that principalities and powers of darkness, the scripture talks about the world, the flesh, the devil. That those forces won't be the primary functions of anything that goes on while we dream and while we sleep. That we turn that whole time over to be a time of worship and praise or whatever the Holy Spirit wants it to be while we sleep. And so thankfulness and allowing God to permeate every area of our life is this goal. Well, notice in verse 5, he goes back and he picks up on the impurity and the sexual immorality or immorality of all kinds. And then he adds another characteristic to it. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person, greedy, ah, will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. So what are we saying here? That as a Christian, if I ever struggle with immorality, that I'm not a Christian. That if I ever find myself with an impure thought, that I'm not a Christian. Don't forget everything that has been said already about the fact that if you're a born-again child of God, you've truly been saved. You're beloved of God. You're beloved of God. But there are those within the church... Jesus talked about the fact that within the church you would have wheat and you would have tares, which are a form of weed that looks like wheat until it gets fully grown. And then the wheat has some benefit to it and the tares just the weed and there's nothing beneficial to it at all. They look the same. They're sitting in the same chairs. They're in the same building and they're nice, good people. But the question is, is have they ever surrendered their heart and life to Jesus? Is their life not their own, but now belonging to Him? And so you would see change. And so if they continue to live in moral lives, if their lives are filled with impurity and they don't have a problem with it. In fact, they even rejoice in it when they're away from the appearances that they're trying to make in the community. And then greed. He goes at greed, though, if you notice, for a greedy person is an idolater. In other words, they are worshiping something other than God. What? Worshiping the things of this world. Okay, that makes it pretty simple. So, as a born-again child of God, I'm living in the kingdom of God. I'm a part of the family of God, and I'm beloved by God. And all of these things that he's doing should then cause me to understand that this world, here comes the song, this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, right? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Now I've got work to do here. But this is not ultimately my home. And so to be a person who's focused on worshiping the things of this world means that I'm off track. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey Him. Now, in the sense of if, if my life is not really a surrender to Christ, I have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior. It doesn't matter if I go to church and go to church. I'm still going to suffer the wrath of God. You see, the only way I avoid the wrath of God is that I put my faith and trust in Jesus. And where did the wrath go that was pointed to me? Where did it go? It went on Jesus. It went on Jesus on the cross. My debt has been paid. And so, as I think about, and, and Paul wants us to, to, you know, as he, the Spirit gives him this message for us today, he wants us to make sure that we're in the kingdom, that we have been adopted by God, that we have surrendered our life to Christ, and that we remember that we're going to struggle with the flesh, but our life, if we struggle with the flesh, what does that show but that we're trying to resist the things of the world? And that's an evidence of the fact that we're a believer. 
If we're not resisting the things of the world and if we're pursuing the things of the world, that would be an evidence that we don't belong to him. But I want to, before I leave this passage, I want to point to the part that says don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. Folks, there are a lot of people who are in pulpits this very day trying to promote a lifestyle where the most important things in your life are happening now. Your best life is now. And you're going to have all kinds of health, wealth, and prosperity and all of these kinds of things. And that then becomes your focus. Instead of being kingdom-minded, you're trying to have it all now. That is someone trying to fool us to excuse the sin of idolatry. So we be careful with those kinds of situations. Notice in verse 7, what are we going to participate in? Now I'm a child of God. I've, I've, I've been saved. I've been born again. What am I going to participate in? Well, I've got to be careful with that. Don't participate in things that these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So what I'm going to do then is live as people of light. I'm going to examine everything that's coming in through my eyes, coming in through my ears, coming into all the inputs that God has given me spiritually. I'm going to evaluate all these things in keeping with the Word of God, led of the Spirit of God, and I'm going to differentiate between what is darkness and what is light. And I will participate in the things of light. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. So whatever God is really doing in my life, and whatever He's calling me to participate in, is going to be something that is moving me toward things that are good. Moving me toward things that are right or righteous. Moving me toward things that are true. And so even as a Christian, not only do I move toward the things that are true, but I'm called to speak the truth. To speak the truth in love. I'm representing Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the love. And so this becomes my way of life. This becomes who I am because that's who Jesus is and now he lives within me by his spirit. So, as you look at this passage, then he says, carefully determine, carefully determine what is pleasing to God. New American Standard, try to learn. A part of the process is learning, is growing, is being a part of discovering who God is so that you can then have him take over that part of your life and be like him in that same way. Amen. Notice, if you would, in verse 11. Remember, we're trying to figure out how, what we're going to participate in, right? That's where we were from the last scripture. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. So, I can either participate in the things that have no value, no purpose of eternal good, things that my flesh enjoys, things that appeal to my senses, that sort of thing, that are in darkness and in evil. Not all things that are pleasant in life are evil, y'all. If, if you ever hear, you think you hear me saying, everything that's pleasant in life is evil, you've heard me wrong. <laughs> you heard me wrong. But there are things that the devil puts in our path for the purpose of distraction and deception that are pleasant things. And he's using that like you use bait when you go fishing. Some of you layers are going, well, you lost me on that illustration. I've never gone fishing and I never will. <laughs> well, maybe I can say like, when you dress up really, really pretty to try to get your husband to take you somewhere finally. <laughs> Use a little bait there, you know. <laughs> All right. 
worthless deeds of evil and darkness. But what about the exposed in thing? I mean, there's a lot of things that are coming out right now uh, in our this current year that we're going on, which is like one of the craziest years ever. Uh, and, and in this, we're finding out that U.S. Marshals are, are being able to crack open the human trafficking thing and they're finding you know thousands of, of children who are have been forced into sex trade and they're and they're bringing them out and and getting them counseling and, and restoring life to them and and all that sort of thing and so they were forced into a world where people are living in worthless deeds of evil and darkness and now someone has come along and exposed it, has revealed who these people are, have taken the children back that were being held captive in that. Do you understand that God is the U.S. Marshals of the spiritual kingdom of God, that He has been bringing us out of slavery and into the light and exposing those things that are making us slaves as we submit ourselves to them? It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. Boy, the more that we hear that everybody used to call conspiracy theory uh, that, that are going on and people in high-ranking positions supposedly involved in it, we may never actually know. But those things are horrific and unimaginable. And here's where Scripture identifies. Their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. Today, if you're a Christian and you're engaged and involved in things as we all are being drawn to, tempted to, seduced to, you understand that God is not going to let that go very long. For whom God loves, He chases. And disciplines every son whom he receives. Why? Well, if you read the verse just before it, it says, I mean, the part at the beginning, for whom God loves. And so he's not going to leave you or I when we get caught up in sin and indefinitely in that situation because he loves us. Remember, we're beloved children. Way back at the beginning of this chapter. And so he loves us enough to pull us back in, to correct us and to discipline us. And so the question is, do we love each other enough to participate in that process? Are we willing to deal with potential conflict? Are we, uh, are we going to be afraid that things would not go the way we hoped? And so God, we can't obey you in this area because it might not go well. Instead of saying, Lord, help us to love like you do. Help us to examine ourselves, deal with our own situations of sin, confess those things, and go out and be salt and light also within our church family. Well, things are going to be revealed ultimately in judgment, and on judgment day, but there will be no fixing that. So today I have to say to you, if you've not responded to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're being called today, awake, O oh sleeper, rise from the dead. Christ will give you life. To respond to the gospel, to come to Him, to be born again. For those of us who have already uh, had that great blessing and that call from God, uh, we have a life to live that will just be shining brightly for the world to see, to be able to see Christ in us and to respond to that as we choose what we participate in, not as a mocking to them, not to say that we're better than them, but so that they can ask us, why won't you participate in the deeds of darkness that we're doing and we have an open door for the gospel? When they say, you know, do you think you're better than us or whatever? And even that winds up to be an opportunity for the gospel because you can say, no, I'm, I'm a, a sinner, but I've been saved by Jesus who loved me enough. And then as, as Mark talked about, we, we share the gospel 
from the what the Holy Spirit provides for us as we look together at the Word of God. So today I would say to you, if you've not never received Jesus, there is a point in life that you will die. It is given unto man once to die. And it's going to happen. The question is, is, will you be ready? And since we don't know what day it is, how long do you think you'll put off? Well, I put it off for quite a while, but here's, when I finally got saved, can I tell y'all something? It wasn't in the sense of, oh well, I guess the fun is over. I finally gave up. It was, here was my thought, my clear thought. And, and, and I'm not going to, you know, just trivially say this. This is honestly what this teenage boy said to himself as he walked home two blocks or so from the church to the house. What was I waiting for? If I could kick myself in the rear end, I'd do it myself. That was, I mean, it's like, of course, if I'd had one of my brothers around, they'd been happy to, you know, do that. But it was like, what was I waiting for? I thought I was going to miss out on something, and now I have been set free from this burden of guilt and shame and and, and sin, and, and I, I, my life wasn't so great because I was avoiding God. In fact, I felt like I was living in bondage. Awake. Go oh, sleep. Rise up from the dead. And Christ will give you life. Well, this is one of the verses that um, I think is uh, pretty key in 19. Ephesians uh, 5, 19 and follow. Our lives become a life, of course. Now, some of us are better at the externals of worship. Maybe we think we have a voice that's good for worship. We, we know how to appear and do like people do in worship. Don't you know God is looking at the heart? Yeah. It, he's not listening. He knows what voice he gave you. Amen? Amen? I mean, if you don't have the greatest voice in the world, who, who do you think gave you that? So that worship would not be a matter of you being enthralled with yourself. <laughs> that happens to people. Speaking to one another. See, it doesn't even actually say something, does it? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Here comes singing. Singing and making melody with your vocal cords. No. With your heart. For the congregation. No. For the Lord. Life becomes a time of worship. giving, Always giving thanks. Remember, we're not going to have the obscene stories, the coarse jesting, all that sort of thing. We're going to have thanksgiving, right? Here it comes again. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Everybody's ready for that passage. It's a zip on by. But do you struggle with the phrase, always giving thanks for all things? For all things. Uh, how many of you are just excited every evening to go to the Lord and say, Lord God, I want to thank you so much for this year. And yet, do you know that this year is in somehow preparation for next year? The year after that, the year after that, as we learn what matters the most. So folks that were not focused on family at all and they were just doing their own thing and all of a sudden all there was was family. And all of a sudden they have to bring relationships and healing and work on family. Are people who were finding their their comfort and, and everything in, in people that they could no longer get to, talk to, whatever. And, and then we were forced to get back to the Lord and to be in His Word. And to find that, that some of our loneliness could be resolved, not only in our relationship with God, but 
with people that God brought in our path. Not people we pursued, but people that He sent along in divine appointments, and maybe they were even folks who were lost, and we were able to share the gospel and see one saved and begin to disciple. And as our needs were being met, their needs were being met. See, I'm not saying that necessarily 2021, I, I've already seen my favorite meme about 2021. Uh, here comes 2021 and it's right on time. And I don't know if you saw this meme, but it reminds me of what happened up in Greaseville. You're standing on the railroad tracks and here comes a locomotive straight on you and it's on fire. Here comes 2021, right on time, you know. And I'm like, no, no, no. It doesn't have to be, even with birth pains, right? There's their time between, right? Okay. But as we think about what God is doing, we can be thankful for the fact that He's in control, that He loves us, that He's at work in our life and experience to teach us and to grow us and to make us more like Jesus. And there's a time at which He's going to bring us home. Some of us are excited about that. We have a tendency to have more miles on our odometer of life than the others who are just ready to get started. <laughs> now this last part. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. That goes back to the church discipline, the loving, caring church discipline role. You and I live in a nation that thinks of independence, of freedom to do my own thing. I mean, I don't, I don't know if when y'all were in the army, if y'all were the army of one. I remember that little logo thing. You were that part of the army of one. So, how many times did you want to be the party, the, the army of one, and run out into Afghanistan by yourself? <laughs> no, don't want to be the army of one that day. And we think of ourselves sometimes as the church, as the army of one. You do your thing, and I'll do my thing, and I'll see you on Sunday. And we'll sing to Jesus, and then we'll go our separate ways. But this is what the Word of God is saying. We're subject to one another. We have a responsibility to each other, for each other, about each other. And so if we think of ourselves as independent, we've got it wrong. We've got back to the world, the flesh, and the devil concept. There's nothing wrong with liberty. But even in, in, the, in the history of our nation, liberty was for the purpose of of people ha having the opportunity to live together in a nation, to have freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Even though they didn't agree on everything, they were going to be able to work together to accomplish the purpose of having an awesome place to live, this nation. And as the church, we have the same thing. We have, we have freedom in Christ from sin and death, we have the liberty to do what's within the Word of God. But folks, we have to be the most dependent people in the world on God. If you're not dependent on God, you don't understand the relationship. We are dependent on God. We are interdependent with each other. And we are free from the power of sin. And that's all the more reason to worship and to thank God, to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. In other words, when it says the fear of Christ, it's indicating that this is something that matters to Jesus enough that he's keeping track of it, which he keeps track of everything, but this is one of those things that there's going to be discipline on. So if a church doesn't operate subject to one another, working together, as a group dependent on God, that church is going to experience discipline and correction. Because he's mad? No. For those not whom God loves, he disciplines. It's courteous every Sunday he receives. So what is the message that is the gospel? 
that is the invitation for you who have not responded today is you look at this from Romans chapter 10. There are a lot of people who think, if I say the right things, and I do the right things. I'll go up, I'll talk to the preacher, I'll say the right things, then he'll let me in the water, and, and I'll have it made. And I can go on with my life. Now you can't go on with your life, because when you become a Christian, it's not your life anymore. If you understand salvation, your life just became his. It was his all along. You've restored it where it belonged. And now you will be more free with him in charge of your life than you've ever been before. And so it's not just saying words. It's true. If, I, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But do you understand that this is not the confession that you make to us? Who is listening to your confession of your mouth that you're declaring Jesus is Lord? How about Jesus? And if he knows that that's not a true confession, if he knows you don't mean it, if he knows that that's not really the desire or intent of your heart, you can deceive everybody here today, but you can also spend eternity in the lake of fire. Because the one you're confessing as Lord is him to Him. And so as you pray and you ask Jesus to save you and you acknowledge Him as your Savior, your Lord, you repent of your sin and you ask Him to make you a child of God, that is a confession that's going to Him. And He knows if it's real. You'll be saved, the pastor says, if you truly confess that to Him. Then it goes on to say, for with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. And so, there is the sense that you are confessing it to God, but when you confess it to men, you see there's this thing that we all deal with, okay, I want to be a Christian, I just don't want anybody to know. <laughs> you know, because they'll pick on me or they'll, you know, say, you know, well... We're not going to, you know, include you in all of our stuff anymore or whatever. Mentally, the devil uses to try to hold us back. And so this idea of confessing to God that you want Him to save you through His Son, Jesus, and then confessing it to men so that you show the world you are a new person in Christ and you are grateful and thankful for His love and for His salvation. That's a part of it. That's the change of our heart. And so today, yesterday, 2,000 years ago, however the long of the Lord tarries, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Please notice, whoever. It does say whoever. Not just a select group of people, not just a certain number of people, not just a certain, a certain type of people. Not ones that qualify in some special way. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Father God, we ask today that you would be with any person here right now that you're, you're reaching their heart and you've touched their mind and you've caused them to know that today is the day when they need to respond to you. That they would turn their thoughts toward you right now and they would say, yes, Jesus. I know I have sinned like everybody else in this world. And I deserve your wrath and punishment for that. And Jesus, would you please come in and save me, make me your own. I want to be a child of God now and forever. Lord, as they pray that prayer, they've confessed it to you. And you've heard their prayer. They have believed that you're able to save them. And you have done so. Now, Lord, help them to take the step of making it known that they would share with someone today, come in this time of invitation, 
talk to myself or Mark, talk to Brian, talk to another person here to say, yes, this day I asked Jesus to come into my life and say, as they confess that word, they'll show their, their, the fact that they're proud and thankful of you and what you've done. And they'll follow you in baptism as you've called us to. But Lord, there are those of us today, we're not very good imitators of you. And sometimes the enemy convinces us there's nothing there worthwhile. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Help us to be excited about who you are and what you're doing, regardless of what happens today, tomorrow, next year, through the years, however long until you come. Help us to be excited about you. More than anything else that we might avoid idolatry, we would thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. In a time of invitation, there might be someone who believes God is calling them to be a part of this church family. You've already been saved, baptized, you don't have a church home, you're welcome.